Hello, I'm Dr. Carolyn Burns, and this is the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. Hi, everyone. This is episode 083 CE of Blood Bank Guy Essentials, the podcast designed to help you learn the essentials of transfusion medicine. My name is Joe Chaffin, and I am your host. I'm going to tell you all about how to build a perfect transfusion committee with my guest, Dr. Carolyn Burns, in just a second. But first, you should know that this is, in fact, a continuing education episode. The free continuing education credit is provided by transfusionnews.com, and Transfusion News is brought to you by BioRad, who has no editorial input into the podcast. This podcast offers a continuing education activity where you can earn several different types of credit, including one AMA PRA Category 1 credit, one contact hour of ASCLS PACE program credit, or one American Board of Pathology Self-Assessment Module, or SAM, for continuing certification. To receive credit for this activity, to review the accreditation and information and related disclosures, please visit wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news. Okay, before we talk about transfusion committees, let's address the proverbial elephant in the room. As I'm recording this in April 2020, everyone in the entire world, for good reason, is really worried about the COVID-19 pandemic. The statistics are, they're awful, and they're crushing, and Honestly, I'm just like all of you. I'm worried about my family and friends too. And truthfully, my day-to-day responsibilities at my blood center in Southern California have just been overwhelming. The stories that we read and hear and see about devastating loss everywhere just break my heart. And I'm sure they do the same thing to you. I admit I'm a really, really emotional person and I've felt like my insides are being torn apart just about every day for the last six weeks or so. So if you have lost someone that you love to this stupid coronavirus, I am so, so sorry. I I send you my best and my most heartfelt thoughts and good wishes for comfort for you, your families, and, and anyone that's been impacted directly by this. But despite all that, we have to live, right? We have to keep going as best we can. So to that end, I thought I would share an interview with you that I did before COVID-19 was even a thing with my friend, Dr. Carolyn Burns. Carolyn is an expert in patient blood management. In fact, she's currently the president-elect of the Society for the Advancement of Blood Management, or SABM. She works as a patient blood management consultant for Acumen, and she is incredibly passionate about helping hospitals understand just how to improve well, really all of their practices surrounding blood management, including developing excellent, engaged, and believe it or not, useful transfusion committees. So no matter where you are right now, Carolyn has some tips that'll help you make your transfusion committee better. If you don't have a transfusion committee and you don't understand why you might even want or need one, guess what? She can help you with that too. So let's listen to my interview recorded pre-COVID with Dr. Carolyn Burns on building the perfect transfusion committee. Hey, Carolyn, welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Good talking to you. Always great to hear your voice, my friend. Well, it's been how long? Like a year or so since I last had you on the podcast. A wonderful conversation about patient blood management. And everyone, I before I say another word, I want to make sure that if you have not heard the talk that I did with Carolyn on patient blood management, that's at bbguy.org slash 067. It is fantastic. And Carolyn waxes eloquent on a lot of the things that we're going to allude to today. And we'll touch on them a little bit, but I just want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. You can get free continuing education for that episode as well. So, I mean, what a bargain, right, Carolyn? I can't believe it. Absolutely. Man, oh man, that's that's fantastic. All right. So today I want to talk to you about building the perfect transfusion committee. And I think that this is a timely topic and one that's for me, very, very interesting in my role as a blood center medical director, because I go out and I see a lot of hospital transfusion committees and I see a wide variety of them. Can you talk to us a little bit, Carolyn, about in your role as a consultant to different hospitals? Is that your experience as well? Oh, absolutely. And it, it's interesting too, Joe, that you say it's timely because when you got a hold of me to pursue this particular session, I had already been asked by two other groups to provide some similar presentations and insights. And, and and I think it is because all of us are recognizing that perhaps we don't have a very effective committee or we want to 
better engage our members on those committees? And how do we really do that? How do we sustain it and drive it forward? Because I think folks are recognizing that perhaps are we falling short in some ways? Are we not doing the best we can do? Are there other things we should be looking at to reinvigorate ourselves and to provide that better patient care through that committee process? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that really, for me, the the groups that I see as I go out to hospitals and I talk to people in my area in Southern California about transfusion committees and about transfusion review and some of the things that we're going to discuss, I kind of see three different types of organizational approaches to this. There are places that I go to that don't currently have a transfusion committee. There are other places that I go to that have a transfusion committee, but it tends to be, you know, three people from the lab and a pathologist sitting around staring at each other, which isn't necessarily the most effective thing in the world. And every now and then I'll see hospitals with wonderful integrated transfusion committees that are deeply involved in patient blood management. And that's fantastic. Quite frankly, those of you that are listening, if you are in that third group, if you have a wonderful integrated patient blood management type committee. That's fantastic. Congratulations. We're so happy for you. Keep listening because I hope you'll learn stuff. But this is really focused primarily to those first two groups, as we discussed, those that either now don't have a, a transfusion committee or those who have what I would call an ineffective transfusion committee. So, Carolyn, let's let's move through this. Let's let's talk just the very basics to start with. What actually is, in your view, a transfusion committee? Well, I see a transfusion committee, whether or not, you know, you want to have the moniker of a patient blood management committee as a dedicated group. Certainly, it tends to be a physician oriented committee because it typically as well in most organizations would be required by bylaws of the hospital facility or system to report to the medical executive committee. So I see this as potentially really more physician driven, but very multidisciplinary with other healthcare providers as a part of that, that really sees their role as not just checking boxes and looking at inventory or blood utilization or even wastage, but going far beyond even some of those minimal requirements that we have for laboratory accreditation or even by federal law in some cases, but really thinking outside the box as to how do our activities of monitoring transfusion and other patient blood management initiatives, how do they change outcomes? How can we apply the evidence and educate ourselves and move the committee and our other colleagues to identifying the effects we have on our patients every single day in terms of their safety and their outcomes and potential of avoiding harm. Right. Absolutely. As I talk to hospitals about transfusion committees, especially those who currently don't have one, I get pushback sometimes, Carolyn. And so I will ask you a very simple and straightforward question. In the United States, is it required that a hospital has a dedicated transfusion committee? No. And I'm glad you asked that. And I can tell you from experience, I did not. In my 20 years of private practice at Jewish Hospital Healthcare in Louisville, I did not have a freestanding dedicated transfusion committee. We ran ours through quality because you were correct. There's no requirement that you have to have that dedicated committee. There are requirements, elements of performance, standards, et cetera, that speak to the fact that there must be transfusion activity oversight. And that comes, as you well know, through many different sorts of organizations, whether that's, again, FDA, Joint Commission, all of us in the laboratory world know College of American Pathologists, AABB, et cetera. But you are correct. As long as you are performing the duties and responsibilities of transfusion oversight and all the key points beneath that, then your your review or your process can be in any way that fits your particular hospital facility. And that, I think, is the key. And to me, I think you said something very important there, and that's that if you are doing all the things that you're required to do by the various organizations, and we're going to get to that in just a few minutes, then you're fine. But folks, if you're sitting there, this is just me speaking my opinion for a second, you agree or disagree in just a second, Carolyn. But I, in my opinion, if you're sitting there and your quote unquote transfusion review is five minutes in a pharmacy committee or three minutes in a quality committee where, yeah, all's good, yay, move on. In my opinion, you are woefully not meeting those requirements. What do you think of that, Carolyn? Is that too strong a statement? 
No, I would completely disagree. And again, just from my own personal experience, it's not that I didn't think, Joe, that for me in the role as the medical director for pathology and transfusion medicine and the folks in my pathology quality review committee, it's not that I didn't think we were doing a good job. We were dotting our I's and crossing our T's. However, I did always feel that we kind of lacked that multidisciplinary insight. I had to get pretty comfortable with driving my own bus. And not that I want to say I didn't try to do it well, because of course I wanted to do it well. But I spent most of my years longing for that type of a committee that was really, again, focused not just on those, yeah, just looking at each other and saying, how much should we use this month or how much you know, did we waste this month and what were our dollars? I really would have loved to have had a broader sweeping scope of practice. So I think if that's kind of what you're doing, and that is, it's insufficient. Even if your accrediting body says, oh yeah, you're doing all the things that your connoisseur is supposed to do. Yep. So it's more than checking boxes. I completely agree with that. So before we get to some of those requirements for review, Carolyn, I want to give you give you the floor for just a moment. And as I mentioned, everyone, bbguide.org slash 067 for Carolyn's full thoughts on patient blood management. But for those who have not yet listened to that, Carolyn, and, and want to know what we're talking about when we say PBM, can you give us the quick thumbnail on what is PBM and how does it relate to what we're talking about today? Yeah, sure. Patient blood management is essentially, if you want to look at the the definition or the scope, the vision, the mission, is essentially landing on four pillars. One is diagnosis and management of anemia. The second one would be minimizing bleeding and blood loss by optimizing coagulation. The third pillar, and we're going to talk, I know a lot about this, is a multidisciplinary approach to perhaps incorporating alternatives, other strategies that might help to limit or eliminate the need for a transfusion, knowing what we know about the risk-benefit ratio nowadays. And all of this rests on that fourth pillar as well, which is a patient-centered approach. And all of that involving that informed choice for our patients to be part of that discussion. And ultimately, all four of those pillars, your ultimate goal, you know, your utopia is what you were you're aiming for is better patient outcomes. So, of course, your transfusion committee or patient blood management committee, by its duties and responsibilities, their charter should be to incorporate the best they can those pillars of blood management. So, again, as you've mentioned, it's not just sitting and looking at just use of blood products and CT ratios and things like this. It goes far beyond. How are we doing in those pillars? How are we broadening our horizons in terms of reaching out for better patient care? Well, I love that. And that's that really, I completely agree, is where we all should be thinking of going. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to get there. One thing before we start down that pathway, I think there's Something that has been huge in my mind ever since I heard Sonny Zeke talk about this in the, I believe it was the 2002 AABB annual meeting, the Emily Cooley lecture, and it was published in Transfusion in 2003, where he talked about the difference between, quote unquote, blood safety and transfusion safety and the difference between just looking at is there HIV in the blood, for example, to to looking at the whole process. Can you talk about how that relates not only to what we're talking about today with transfusion slash PBM committees, but just in terms of our, our whole goal as we're as we're doing this whole thing? Yes, that's such a wonderful, wonderful article. And Sunny really, I mean, it still resonates today just like it did back in 2002 when he gave that lecture. It was outstanding. And I'm glad you brought that up, Joe. Because, yeah, when we look, and in fact, this really feeds into patient blood management and why we've gone where we've gone with this whole concept, is that if you look at transfusion, and you know this better than anybody because you're at a donor center, the blood donor centers do a magnificent job of providing blood safety. On your backs are the provision of our blood products and the testing of our donors and the testing of our products and the sterility of our products and the transport to us of those products, right? But if you really look at the scope, at the scale of the entire process, again, two-thirds of that really rests with those of us 
that are making that medical decision to transfuse and those that work with us to administer the blood. So we're really talking about the medical decision to transfuse. Incorporation is going to set the whole process into action. We're going to test that particular blood component and cross-match it. We have to have people that can safely issue it, transport it. We have certain transportation requirements, et cetera. And then, of course, we can't forget about our nurses who probably 95% of transfusion is performed by nurses. It's not performed by us physicians that are ordering the blood. And they have to be with the patient and monitor the patient. And then we have to continue to monitor those patients, not just through the transfusion, but beyond. So really, it's that, and it sounds a little kitschy, but it really is that vein-to-vein transfusion safety chain. And if you will, it kind of pushes us down this road to say, The transfusion committee and patient blood management should not just be product focused. We need to be patient focused. So I think Sunny really had that whole concept in a nutshell in that particular presentation and ultimately that publication. And those of you who have not managed to to read that article, Sunny published it. It was, again, it was in the journal Transfusion in 2003. I will put that reference, everyone, on the show page for this episode. So please, please read that if you haven't. It's marvelous. It was really, it was a landmark talk. I, I can't tell you, I'm sure you feel the same, Carolyn. I can't tell you how many times I've referred to it and had, and seen other people refer to it. It's just, it's tremendous. I can't overstate that. So you got to check that out, everyone. So show page for this episode, bbguy.org slash 083. All right, Carolyn. So we need to we need to jump back to the to the why and to the to the what kind of things we need to look at and what the re- requirements are. Just to summarize, everyone, we've said you don't necessarily have to have a dedicated transfusion slash patient blood management committee. However, you have to be doing the things that are required of you. So that's where we need to to spend a few minutes, Carolyn. What are those things that are required, and by which organizations? Yeah, sure. So in a sense, if you want a justification for the benefits of having your committee or continuing and sustaining and moving forward with your committee, sure. And even historically, we know that there's been a call to action even since the 1930s for some sort of review process for transfusion. And ultimately, that kind of culminated as we came in through the 1960s, 1970s, the Joint Commission, of course, put out that there was a need for transfusion practice review, and the Joint Commission does provide elements of performance, as they call them, for what is required in their view as an accrediting body for hospitals and infusion centers, et cetera, for that sort of transfusion review. Of course, again, those of us that are in the laboratory, we know as well, we have those additional elements of performance, standards, accreditation, checklists, if you will, through College of America Pathologists and AABB. So some of those include, if you look at FDA, of course, FDA does require, and this really lands in your lap too, Joe, again, being at a donor center, you all are highly regulated by law, by good manufacturing processes. That takes into consideration registration, product licensure, error reporting, et cetera. If you look at CMS, then we all know that CMS is, uh, you know, in our lap along with CLIA. That also speaks to certain registration requirements, certifications, inspections. Then we get into the accrediting bodies like Joint Commission or if you're HFAP or DNV, all of them have similar standards or elements of performance that they want your facility to meet in terms of oversight of transfusion practice. And then again, ABB and CAP, if you if you get into the nuts and bolts of that, CAP alone with their one standard, if you will, on their laboratory checklist for you to be accredited by them, which by the way, CAP has deemed status with joint commission. They have a huge long paragraph of what just is expected What are the duties and responsibilities for the medical director of the transfusion alone? And it is broad, and it encompasses all transfusion practice within your inpatient and outpatient facilities. So it's a lot of activity, and the devil's in the detail. And then if you look at some of their standards, it's not just for what happens in the blood bank again. It's perioperative. You look at ABB. That one always gets people, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, when when you when you go into and you do, I've I like you, I'm sure, have done many cap inspections. And when you go in and you talk to typically pathologists, not always pathologists, but people that are in charge of the transfusion service, and you mention to them, well, what are you doing with perioperative? And they look at you blankly, like, what? 
that's not my deal. What are you talking about, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and it really does fall under your purview. And, and I think as the medical director, that also, let's make this point. If you take it then to what are these things then that the members on your transfusion committee need to know? I'm not suggesting that every clinician, let's say, that's on your transfusion committee, every nurse, every risk manager will get into the composition of, of you know, who should be on your committee. I'm not saying that everyone has to know the regulations, the standards, elements, performance, perhaps such as your medical director or transfusion service does or your blood bank supervisor, but they need to understand the concepts and be cogent enough to speak to, again, this is the why we need to do that. And we always have to step back, as my one good colleague always says, always ask the whys, because these things are important. They're there for patient safety. So you don't have to know all the details, but it's good to understand that concept behind transfusion safety oversight and what is required by these different organizations and inspecting bodies, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. Finally, what about AABB standards? Obviously, not everyone is AABB accredited. Where I live in California, it's state law that everyone has to follow AABB standards. But what kind of things does AABB ask us for? Oh, yeah. So ABB, they get, they get deep into the weeds as well. And this would include everything from ordering practices to processes around patient identification, sample collection, near-miss events, other adverse events, usage and discard and reasons for wastage, appropriateness. And I know we'll talk about that. Blood administration policies, are they aligned with your patient safety and quality risk assessments, compliance in all sorts of peer review. And they make a pretty strong statement that if you're following their standards, this is for all categories of blood components. So in other words, it's not just you look at your red cells. We all know you need to look at plasma, platelets, cryoprecipitate, even if you're looking at fractions, et cetera. And this isn't a, well, kind of, sort of, maybe you should do this. This is a should be monitor. And I think intuitively we all know that, but it's, again, a good way if you're trying to get your committee started or or get it, again, reinvigorated, go back sometimes and review some of these items because I think it'll make you realize that ultimately the benefit of your committee is that you will really help maintain those compliance and regulatory requirements, even if peripherally so, based on your subspecialty, and you'll understand that it improves that patient safety and efficacy. And so, Caroline, I know there's an organization that's very near and dear to your heart, the Society for the Advancement of Blood Management. And I be- you're like the president-elect, right, of SABM. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes, I am. And it's, it's such a wonderful group. And I've been so honored to be around the amazing people that are in that professional society. It's, it's crazy cool. It, <laughs> I'm guessing that SABM has weighed in on this as well. Does SABM have any thoughts on what transfusion safety oversight should look like? Yes, they do. And in fact, SABM, by the way, if you go on their website, you, you can see some of the resources they have there in terms of, you know, quality guides. And they actually have standards. In fact, they're on their fifth edition, was published late 2019, for their standards for patient blood management. And as a part of that, they do talk about the transfusion slash patient blood management committee and that it needs to be patient-centered. It should have a physician as a medical director. It's a multi-specialty steering committee, are their words. They look at approving policies, procedures, protocols. Again, defining, which this is what I love, and it's the sense asking for a charter. What is your committee scope, your mission, your vision? What are your values? What are your practices? And again, continuous oversight, whether that's reviewing some sort of policies, procedures every year, taking on projects like anemia management and correlating those with patient outcomes. So yes, they have an entire subsection on uh, safety, transfusion safety oversight. So I think that we both fall in the same category here, Carolyn. I, I, I'm pretty sure I can speak for you when I, when I say that I believe that both of us feel that having a dedicated transfusion slash patient blood management committee is probably best practice and probably the best thing. But in terms of how would you, if you were coming to someone and saying, okay, here are several things that are really just in a nutshell, the reasons why you should consider having a dedicated committee, how, how would you answer that question? Again, I think that the focus of your committee should be that you help to maintain, of course, as we mentioned, those regulatory or compliance issues that one must do within your facility, but looking also at improving transfusion safety and efficacy in an evidence-based manner and managing, of course, any patient blood management activities. We've talked about a host of things. I think ultimately what it does, it provides consistency 
for your evidence-based transfusion and patient blood management practices. All right. Well, so I, I'm right there with you. I completely agree. And I hope we've convinced anyone that's a, that's a doubter out there that there is really a benefit to having a dedicated transfusion committee slash PBM committee. But I'm pretty sure I know you well enough to know that you're not satisfied just with that. Having a committee, as I said before, is not the same necessarily as having an effective committee. So I think that we need to help people. I mean, the title of this interview is Building the Perfect Transfusion Committee. So let's Let's do that. Let's talk about for those who are just starting and for those who already have a transfusion committee that they think needs to do more. What to you is the first characteristic of an effective transfusion committee? And some of these thoughts, by the way, I'll just pitch this out there, Joe. Some of this really came to me because I was lucky enough to be a part of the second edition of a wonderful book, The Transfusion Committee, Putting Patient Safety First. And it was edited by Dr. Saxena, who I believe is is still in the Southern Cali area. But it's, it's a wonderful publication from ABB Press, and I would recommend it to anybody that's looking for kind of the blueprint. So some of my comments are really based on it because as I read through the book and prepared to, you know, kind of help out with that newer edition those few years ago, again, these things resonated with me about, in a sense, with what was I lacking at my own institution? And so they, they really speak to things. And the first thing is, we've, and we've already used this word, it needs to be multidisciplinary. As much as I loved in my practice having my blood bank peeps and my lab administrator and me waxing philosophically and doing our best to monitor all these things, I really felt I would have done so much more. I could have moved light years ahead had I had a multidisciplinary team. And I see that as being a membership that reflects your medical staff, your nursing staff. It needs to be different subspecialties, et cetera. Whenever I go and help client hospitals, I'm like you, you know, I don't want it just to be those couple of people. I really want to see physicians. I want to see administrative champions, certainly lab, nursing. How about perfusion? These people are giving blood in your ORs. We want quality and risk management. Oh my goodness, don't forget your pharmacist. And people that know me know I'm always saying the pharmacy is your friend. And there are so many patient blood management initiatives that come through pharmacy. Just think about what your pharmacy houses in terms of your fractions that you might use. Have an IT person from time to time. Because when you're building guidelines and embedding this into CPOE, you have to have IT. They need to be on your team. You have to occasionally have a finance person. Your bean counters do matter. You know, they do help you be fiscally responsible and help you with budgets. And that, you know, we have to be that way. You know, I'm always going to put in a plug for the donor center. Again, I might, if you were in my region, I might ask you to, that you have to be there at every one of my quarterly meetings, but I certainly would reach out once a year because the donor centers have unbelievable new processes, components, things that are going on in your world that we need to incorporate and learn. And from time to time, I'm one of those people that I say, ask some of your biomedical people to come on your team. That's multidisciplinary. They're the people that take care of your rapid infusers, your blood warmers, all of your refrigerators, your freezers, all those things. They need to understand how they fit into the scope of transfusion practice and how they help to maintain safety. And I'd say the same for transport staff. They need to understand why they are so key to that whole idea of proper patient identification and delivery of our components to the correct OR suite, et cetera. Again, some of these people don't have to be there every time, but that's really how you build that committee is get all the people to the table and play to their strengths. So one of the things that you that you mentioned, and I'm I'm going to come back to that donor center thing in just a second, because obviously that's near and dear to my heart, but the administrative champion. And I think that In my opinion, Carolyn, a lot of the success of your committee depends on having some some buy in from administration. And I wonder how in your experience have you gained that? How do you do that? How do you find someone in administration that's going to get passionate about what you're doing and help you to actually move the mission of your transfusion committee forward? Yeah, well, and that's hard when you're trying to engage, you know, anyone, but yes, particularly with administrative folks, because sometimes we do tend to keep clinical and administrative duties in separate, you know, using that word we always use in different silos. But sometimes you can, you know, I found that in approaching the chief medical officer, because most often that is someone that has been clinical throughout their career, understands what the clinical team wants and understands perhaps that scope of practice. And then can be that interface with other non-medical administrators. 
I have been at some places, however, that it's been a vice president of clinical practices that ends up getting really excited and juiced over this. I can tell you one of my administrative champions was actually for a period of time, we had you know, the president of our hospital who had really been involved with establishing the bloodless program. And although that gentleman didn't always come to, again, my kind of fragmented quality meetings, but certainly he was always asking because he had this special interest in bloodless. So as we started to expand into patient blood management, he was always a little bit piqued. So again, just going around trying to find that person, and I would agree, attitude reflects leadership, as they say in that movie, Remember the Titans. And you read leadership from all different areas of your hospital, including administration. I agree. And just a little side tip for everyone out there, I I will say this, and this is me being perhaps a tiny bit devious, but I don't think it's being devious, Carolyn. Oftentimes, if you point out some of the, just the raw savings, the raw monetary savings that effective patient blood management tends to result in, again, that's not our goal. We're not trying to save money. We're trying to save patients. I fully am on board with that. But sometimes pointing out some of those monetary benefits that have been reported in the past can get administrative people, not necessarily the medical administrative people, but the administrative administrative people more interested in the process. Is that a fair way to put it? Yes. And I don't feel badly, and I say this very often, what is so wrong or why can't we view this as a win-win? If I can get better, safer, more effective care for our patients through PBM and best transfusion evidence-based practice and be fiscally responsible, why not? So yes, if you can get one of your C-suite people to get that touch point and that's their reason, well, then I'm all for it. Bring them to the table. I agree with you. I agree with you completely. So I do want to mention the donor center thing. We're going to talk more about the, when we get to the next point about bringing additional medical staff people in, but let's just make a quick point about donor center people. So folks, I don't have much of a question here, Carolyn, other than I I want to give my opinion for just a second. As a donor center physician, I can tell you that I 100% agree with what Carolyn said. You don't necessarily have to have your donor center doc at every meeting. And in fact, sometimes they won't be available to be at every meeting. But having them there every now and then to keep you up to date with new things that are coming down the line, to help you understand how to integrate with the donor center, to help understand when supplies are limited, and most importantly, from my perspective, to build a relationship with that donor center doc so that when you have trouble or when you have a case that might be transfusion-related acute lung injury or you need help with something that's going on in your hospital, those donor center doctors can be a wonderful resource. So Again, I don't really have a question there, Carolyn, other than just to say I agree that I think it's vital to get your donor center docs involved. I do, too. And I think in particular in this this day and age with so many new processes and products coming out, it's hard to stay on top of those things. And as you mentioned, I would agree in terms of provision of products. And I personally had a wonderful relationship with our donor center medical director who was always, you know, I could pick up the phone. And even our component lab people, our reference lab people, they were a stone's throw away from us and were always willing to help guide us when we had questions and concerns. So sure, get that person again, give them a seat at the table. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so so your first characteristic of an effective patient blood management slash transfusion committee is that it is multidisciplinary. What is number two, Carolyn? Yeah, number two is to be representative. And this is where, again, it feeds into that concept of being multidisciplinary. You want to have strong representation of physicians and nurses from different subspecialties, and in particular, those subspecialties that are touched by transfusion and ultimately patient blood management strategies. And I don't mean to be glib, but, you know, I'm, again, for people that know me, they know I'm married to a physician, but my husband is an ophthalmologist. I'm not going to tell my husband, Frank, that he's the person I really want on that committee because he doesn't transfuse. We just flat out will not. I mean, it doesn't affect him. So that's not, even though they might be willing, what you really want is the guy or the gal at the table that has been touched by transfusion, that needs to understand it and wants to learn about it, wants to participate in that. So we're really talking about cardiac surgery, trauma surgery, general surgery, anesthesia, you know, our critical care docs, our hematology oncology docs, ER docs, you know, your peds neonates. And this means also outpatient and inpatient representation because we know a significant amount of transfusion goes on in our outpatient infusion centers or even in physician offices. So so incorporate those kinds of people, and it kind of leads to that next thing, that if then you're going to do a committee chair, 
as much as I'm not bashing pathologists, because obviously I am one. But, you know, it's kind of nice if you have your chair, or at least a co-chair, not be your pathologist, but be, again, one of the physicians or clinical care providers that is from one of those subspecialties. It just brings a little bit of credibility, I think, to the situation, and it gets that clinical conversation going so you feel that you are truly incorporating those clinical colleagues, and it's not just something that's an initiative from the laboratory. So I have to tell you, Carolyn, the cynic in me, and I'm sure the cynic in some people sitting out there listening right now, is saying, okay, seems like a great idea, Carolyn. Seems like a a logical, perfect world scenario. But man, when I talk to my doctors, they're way too busy and they don't they don't want to quote unquote waste their time with a transfusion committee. So again, in your experience, you've consulted with places on doing this, you've established them in your own hospitals. How do you pitch this to your clinicians so that they understand that there's value here? Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's yeah, it's it's kind of what you're asking me is what's the secret sauce? And I'm not going to tell you I've cracked that code completely. I will just admit to you, I, I haven't gotten there quite yet with every place that I've ever worked with. But I think if the group sits down, the little nugget formative group sits down and you start to list pen on, you know, to paper of the different subspecialties you want. I think looking in each of those departments, because, you know, when you're at your facility, you know the doctors and nurses that you might like to approach. And some of them you may have to take a little bit of a different tack than others. Always, I think, having them understand the why you feel this is important for them to be there is good. But in particular, if you can speak to them in terms, again, of their strengths that they would bring to the table and also assure them, and we're going to get to this later, assure them that you are going with this committee, you will do your best to minimize the amount of time that is wasted. I mean, this has got to be a group that's very focused. It's got to be action oriented and focused. And sometimes you can snag that particular physician. The other thing to do is sometimes the physician or the nurse that's been a naysayer, oh, that's the perfect person. We welcome controversy. That's why we want you here. And so sometimes playing that card can really be advantageous. And I've seen it happen where the person that came in being the complete naysayer of A, B, or C concept becomes your biggest advocate. Another thing I think to pitch out is, yes, within your department, you might be the go-to person that is listed on the committee. But if, in fact, you can't be there because your clinical care duties are not allowing for that day, something happens. We all know patient safety comes first. It, It trumps everything, right? But have one of your partners go. See if one of your colleagues within your department can go. And that also is a good way to get get a little bit of potential onboarding. So as you roll off that committee, perhaps in your term, someone else has already been around to understand the concepts. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think there's a couple of really important, well, actually, all of that is really important. The one thing that I'll just zero in on for a second, and again, I know we'll come back to this, is the focus. I'm convinced that If you try to convince a clinician to be a part of a committee and you tell them you'll have to do this and you'll have to do that and you'll have to do the other thing that sounds administrative to them, they're going to fight you. They're going to resist that and not be interested. But if you keep it focused and we're not going to waste your time, I love what you said, we're not going to waste your time and sell them on the vision. I think that's I think that's the way to go. So I'm I'm right there with you, Carolyn, in in terms of what you're saying. Well, so we've talked about we've talked about the first two characteristics that they should be multidisciplinary and representative. Let's hit the third one. What do you think the the third characteristic of an effective committee should be? Well, this kind of feeds in to what you were saying about if you if you can get them to buy into the concept. And so this is the whole idea about being and as pointed out again in that Saxena book is being activists. This is not as you mentioned earlier, two or three people sitting around a table having pretzels and a diet coke and looking at data. It's not. You have to truly, truly believe. And I know people probably think I'm nuts, but I want people to truly believe when they come to that table and they're part of this committee that you are coming to be active in this. This isn't a ho-hum, oh yeah, let's just, you know, meet a little bit and talk about something, something. This means you are 24-7, 365 days out of a year. I don't mean you're on call. That's not my, what I'm saying. But it means in your brain and in your heart, you are truly committed to appropriate transfusion, evidence-based transfusion, and additional patient blood management strategies that can improve patient 
care. I am here for patients. So let's go get them. So you have to have the group really feel that patient blood management is not an option. And in fact, if you're not doing it, there's been a recent editorial that speaks to its substandard care. So feeding each other as caregivers to understand we are actively promoting better patient outcomes. That's fantastic. I I love that. I could not possibly agree more. And I I don't think there's a whole lot more to say about that, Carolyn. I think that's massively important that you have to have a mission. And I think maybe we'll get to that a little bit in in the next point, but there has to be something that you're shooting towards. And that is, as as you said, to the goal of we're we're trying to do something here. And as as everybody understands that, that makes it much easier for everyone to to row in the same direction. So right there with you. Yeah, and I and I think it brings up, you know, kind of brings up an idea about charters. I've noticed that some very, very successful transfusion committees have actually put, again, pen to paper, made a charter. And at the beginning of their meetings, They re-read, someone reads out loud their mission vision statement. So again, it centers everybody from the, it's kind of how other committees use safety stories, something like that, that really makes you recall, wow, this is the purpose. This is the reason I'm here. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Love that. Okay. So, so we've, we've talked about being multidisciplinary, being representative, having an activist role. And then the last one is kind of an interesting one. And you've talked uh, that book in particular talked about the three wells. What are the three wells? What does that mean? Yeah. So they're well-planned, well-focused and well-documented. And this really speaks to this whole idea, again, of let's be on time delivering agendas and let's stick with agendas. Let's have our minutes, send them out with action items, have everyone be able to review some of those documents before you come in the room. So again, we're not wasting time. We want all those reports to be available. So you do have to be very organized and plan for your meetings, plan ahead for the meetings and keep everyone on top of that commitment to that meeting. And then again, focusing, what are the, let's say you've chosen because of your mission for your particular committee that year, you have focused on three key performance indicators. Just focus on those key performance indicators. Sure, you can have data on usage, wastage, other things, dollars, whatever that happens to be, and that can be in a sense for information. And if there are trends, you can focus on those. But try to really keep it to those those projects or action items, those key performance indicators, and document those things so everyone knows where you are. I think we all know, Joe, I've been a part of these meetings too, that you're going, oh my gosh, this is like moving at a glacial pace, and all this is doing is wasting my time, and I'm going to start checking my phone. We don't want that. So I think really being everyone committed to being well-planned, well-focused, and well-documented. Agreed. And I, I think the I think the faster the pace within reason, of course, but the faster the pace and the, the more things feel like they're moving and the less things feel like they're dragging, the better your repeat attendance is going to be, in my experience. Yeah. And also by focusing on those things, then when you have something fabulous that you've done, you've completed a project, you've shown those better outcomes, you celebrate those. And that that again feeds the group. It keeps us all moving down that, you know, we're excited about that. So what's next, in other words? So it just keeps that fervor and 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 that that feeling of of we're doing a good thing here. That's fantastic, Carolyn. So I think as we as we close out our time together, I, I want to focus in on a slide that you made that you were kind enough to share with me and, and we're going to share with our with our audience today. Everyone, Carolyn put together a slide that talks about the kind of things that effective patient blood management slash transfusion committees need to be looking at and need to be focusing on. That will be on the show page for this episode. Again, bbguy.org slash 083. But Carolyn, I wonder if you could just kind of hit the highlights of that for us. What are the kind of things that as you're putting together your agenda as you're putting together your plans and maybe even your charters, what should people be looking at in order to be one of those effective committees? Yeah, sure. And and um, when they look at the slides, some of these are, are things that we know, again, by either regulation or standards, element performance, you really need to be looking at. I mean, let's face it, everyone's probably going to have within their blood bank, they're going to look at their CT ratios, and those can be useful. You can look at your percent of single unit transfusions for your red cells. And even for platelets, because we know the new evidence really speaks to why well, give two and one will do. I think looking at transfusion documentation, your nurses know they're required to document. Anesthesia knows they have to document. All of those things we know we need to do, and those can be very informative. 
blood wastage. Very important. And I would suggest always putting a reason for that wastage because, again, it can provide a focus for where you need to work. How can we work on this so we waste less? But let's expand that horizon now to looking at things like transfusion appropriateness, use of transfusion guidelines, peer review. Do you have a way to benchmark by blood utilization, by DRG, service line, a thousand patient days, things like that, that some facilities do have the capability. And then you move into some more broader concepts of blood management. How are we doing our informed choice process? And listen to my words, informed choice, not informed consent. Use of pharmaceuticals. Here's your pharmacy again. Are we incorporating those? How are we doing that? How are we using cell salvage, acute normal volemic hema dilution? How are we using topical hemostatics? Are these, again, anemia management? Where are we with laboratory services so we avoid iatrogenic blood loss from phlebotomy? How about educational oversight? What do you do for your fellow clinicians and care providers to continuously educate them? That could be a great role for the folks on your, you know, your team to be participating in. And again, I'll say donor center services. How are you interacting? Do you have a regular meeting? Do you have a liaison? And how is that going? How is that improving your patient outcomes? So I think all these things, some of which are are very common and people know they need to do them, and some are more conceptual, but can be very formative and transformative for your facility and for your patients. I agree. And I, I have to tell you, and this is just me as a personal aside, I, like you, have sat in a lot of transfusion committees over the long time that I've been doing transfusion medicine. I can't remember the last time a CT ratio actually was incredibly useful for me, but maybe I'm different. But (laughs) that's one while people do and I get it. it, Honestly, I rarely find a ton of value in it. And I don't know, maybe I'm an outlier there, Carolyn. What do you think? Well, you know what? Here's the only reason that I didn't mind watching the CT ratio, but it was very specific for, for us at my institution at the time because we were moving towards some more of the physician order entry and standard paper order sets. And what I started doing is looking at CT ratios and the physicians that had high CT ratios. I started talking with them. And what I would do is essentially say, well, I applaud you in one sense, Dr. Jones, because having a high CT ratio means you're not transfusing, right? Congratulations. Thank you. But what it's telling me is you're wasting the time and the money to cross-match that patient when you don't need to. So what it did was it fed us back to developing a maximal surgical blood ordering schedule. It also fed us back into, because some of those physicians looked at me and said, Carolyn, I never order a type and cross-match for that type of case. And you know what we found? We found we had old standing orders that were out there. We found something as simple as in our computer... T and C for type and cross match was alphabetically above T and S for type and screen. And our unit clerks were just probing the first one they saw. So some of these little things you could do. And you know what? We saw every one of those doctors that had those high ratios, boom, they came down when we started to clean up the house. It was pretty insightful. So you never know. You never know. (laughs) So I didn't say don't do it. I just said I haven't found it terribly useful. Okay, fair enough. I stand corrected. Okay. (laughs) So I would like to close with this, Carolyn. This topic that that I'm going to bring up to you is, is one that we could spend an entire hour on by itself. So obviously we don't have that kind of time. But I do want to talk to you about what I think people perceive as one of the areas where conflict can come up in this entire process, and that's specifically the peer review of transfusion appropriateness and transfusion order guidelines. So again, without being able to to go enormously into it, I think a lot of hospitals see that as a barrier. Quite frankly, they're a little afraid of that. How are we going to do that? Now, granted, as we already talked about, you're required to do it, but can you share some tips with us, some practical tips on, on how we do this, how we implement guidelines? Is is it enough to just say, okay, here's our guidelines, everybody. Yay, everybody follow them. How do you move that into practice in your hospital? Yeah. Well, the biggest success that I've seen that I've been able to have, and that's when I, and also, by the way, it's not just me. I have to say, I worked with some amazing, some amazing people with, you know, companies that asked me to come in and help and their clinical leads are fabulous at change management and, and also the people boots on the ground that are in the facility. So I have to give a shout out to those folks that really get it. And it makes my job a whole lot easier. But I think Most of us, as far as our clinical colleagues, you know, physicians, mid-level care providers, nurses, and and our laboratorians in particular, we learn best if we understand the state of the science. We want to know the why. Tell me why. 
show me the evidence. Show me the money. Not literally the money, but you know, show me the stuff here, Carolyn. And so very often it seems like the more successful implementation of better transfusion and better patient blood management practices are formulated in the state of the science. You get people to read and understand that literature and say, aha, now you've told me the why, now how do I go do it? So once they understand, let's say red cells, just in this case, we all know the literature and we've presented the literature, we've discussed the literature, we agree with the literature in principle and practice. So now we're going to build, based on that evidence, what are our guidelines potentially embed them into CPOE. And we always know that there's going to be that patient that doesn't fit the textbook definition, right? So when you start to do that and and you agree to those guidelines and now they're in your CPOE, all of the folks on your medical staff, nursing staff, et cetera, have to understand, yes, you're going to use some of those, that data. Let's say you're pulling data on how many patients have hemoglobins above eight and are being transfused. Well, you can look at those individual cases, and that's where your multidisciplinary team comes into play. Because as a pathologist, I might not understand the particular characteristic of your cardiovascular surgery patient. So we can bring those things to that entire group and scratch our heads, look at the chart, say what's going on. The other goodness is this isn't supposed to be used as punitive. I would say that if you start using your guidelines and looking at appropriateness of those guidelines, number one, it helps you as the evidence changes to change those guidelines. These are living, breathing things. And then also within a department, a department or group of physicians can use that to see the variability they even have. And, you know, physicians were pretty competitive, And at the end of the day, it's really no different than what we all do in pathology, where we go back and each one of us, like in my group, we had five pathologists, and someone would go back and review every one of my first and section diagnoses, and wouldn't I feel pretty badly if I were the only outlier that I was not reading? You know, seriously. And I've seen that happen with with groups, where they kind of go, wow, well, doctors one, two, three, and four transfusing at this level and seem to be doing okay. What's kind of wrong with me? You know, and and I think physicians are perfectly capable of doing that on their own. So I think just giving, starting with the state of the science and everybody understanding that, it's far easier than to move, incorporate guidelines, merge them into CPOE, and then have a way to be able to go back and pull that data and look at it. You're never going to be 100%. We know that. Because, you know, we're not making widgets here. Absolutely right. And I think from my perspective, what you just said, especially talking about once you're putting these things out, that it comes with education, that it comes with why is so important. And I think that gets missed a lot, that we expect clinicians to just, without really having a background in transfusion medicine, I, I think that's one thing that a lot of laboratorians in particular miss, that most physicians, I'm guessing you didn't get a whole lot of transfusion medicine education in medical school. I didn't. And most physicians don't have that background. We have to give them something to stand on to understand the why. And I think that's hugely important. And I've mentioned this about nurses too. Nurses, I have a a friend of mine that used to say that in nursing school, he spent more time learning how to make a bed than he did delivering a transfusion. I mean, we were being a little bit glib in that conversation, I'll admit. But he said, you know, we don't. And you know what? Our nurses as primary transfusionists accept the responsibility of that high volume, high risk activity. And the nurses also, by understanding the state of the science, it empowers them to perhaps question, why are we doing this transfusion? Or maybe why not? Or while they are transfusing, what am I watching for? And I think it's important that we all understand that literature. I think by giving that literature to our blood bank medical technologists, our clinical laboratory sciences, scientists, they'll go, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And then we're, if we're all educated on the same evidence, then we talk better to each other. And that's what it's all about. It is. And in the end, as you said, to kind of bring this all back to where we started, it's all about keeping our patients safe, right? That's what we're trying to do. That's our whole entire goal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was interesting because Sabum's little byline on their on their website says, "Education, evidence, better patient outcomes." Yep, absolutely. Well, Carolyn, this has been a fantastic conversation, and I think that you have well, you've convinced me, and I hope that you've convinced some of the folks out there that it's not just a good idea to have a transfusion committee slash PBM committee. In fact, let's just call it a PBM committee. That I think that's uh, that's a great goal for us to get towards. I think that you've given us a lot of good reasons to do this, a lot of whys, which I think is vitally important. 
So thank you so very much for spending time with me. Well, thanks, Joe. It's always a pleasure. And thanks for getting our, you know, the message out about this. And, I, and I do, I'm with you. I hope this helps. And, and some of the resources that you put up on the, on the website, I think, would be really useful. So thanks. Hi, everyone. It's Joe with just a couple of quick thoughts before I let you go. I do want to mention again that this is a continuing education activity. So if you're a physician or a laboratorian, don't forget to visit wileyhealthlearning.com slash transfusion news to get your hour of totally free continuing education credit. Just a reminder, my thanks for that, as always, to Transfusion News, to BioRed, who brings you Transfusion News, as well as to Wiley Health Learning, of course. So I'm deciding where to go with the next episode of Blood Bank Guy Essentials, to be honest. Many of you have written to ask if I'll do an episode on COVID-19 convalescent plasma, and I will be making that decision soon. I have several other episodes, several other interviews that I've recorded prior to COVID, so we'll see what happens, but please check back soon. But until next time, my friends, I hope that you smile and have fun. This is important. Tell the ones that you love that you do, and above all, never, ever stop learning. Thanks very much for listening. I'll catch you next time on the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast.